In order to measure the image distance for virtual images, we're going to use the method of parallax. What is parallax? Well, take your thumb, hold it in front of your face and choose an object in the room where you're standing. Cover that object with your thumb while you've got your eye shut. Which one? Actually, let me think about that as I look at these pictures here. I think you should shut your right eye. No, your left eye, yeah. Shut your left eye and move your thumb until it's covering up that object that you've picked on the wall or wherever the object is. And now switch eyeballs. So open your left eye and shut your right eye. And you should see your thumb jump over the, the field behind it. And that effect is called parallax. Now, hopefully when you just did that, you had your thumb fairly close to your face. By the way, this is my thumb. I don't recognize it. Normally when I look at my thumb, it doesn't look like that, but you know, the camera adds 10 pounds. Do the same thing now, but put your thumb farther from your face like this. So open your left eye, cover the object, and then shut your left eye. I got that backwards, didn't I? Anyway, you'll figure it out. But observe that the parallax is considerably less when your thumb is far from your face. So as a general rule, things that are closer to your eyeballs exhibit more parallax when you switch eyeballs than do things farther from your face. And you can understand that by looking at this diagram. So here are the two eyeballs on either side of your strangely constructed face. When you're looking with this eyeball, your line of sight passes through the object and strikes something behind it. In this case, that was the, uh, the flower holder on the wall, the sconce, whatever you call that thing. But then when you switch eyes, the line of sight uh, heads off in a different direction. So your brain perceives the object as being in front of the blue square first, as you can see down here. And then your brain perceives the object as being in front of something else. Now, I think your brain is a little more sophisticated than that, at least most of you. So I'm not giving your brain enough credit because there's that whole depth perception thing. And um, it, when things are in motion, your brain is probably accounting for the parallax somehow. Anyway, you could call this angle right here, the parallax angle. And this effect is actually used to make precise measurements of the distance to faraway objects like stars. Now it only works for, for relatively nearby stars, which are still very far away. It's not going to work so well for, for stars that are on the other side of the galaxy, certainly not. But for the closest stars, you can actually use parallax to measure the distance to that star. And here's how you would do that. So this blue circle represents the Earth's orbit around the sun, of course, not to scale. And here is a very nearby star. Well, very nearby, meaning like four light years away or more. And we know that it takes a year to orbit the sun. So pick two opposite positions of the earth in its orbit around the sun. Those occur six months apart. And when the earth is here and you're looking at that star, it appears to be in front of some other faraway object back here, presumably more stars that are much further away or much farther away. Six months later, you're looking from up here. And so your line of sight is in a slightly different direction. This angle is totally exaggerated in the diagram. I mean, because this angle looks like 40 degrees. In reality, it's much less than 1 60th of 1 60th of 1 degree. Parallax angles are really small when you're talking about stellar parallax. So the closer the star is to the Earth, the more parallax it exhibits. So let me hit play here. And I don't know what's up with this orange dot. I guess that's supposed to be the sun. But watch the red dot, how it uh, wiggles back and forth throughout the year. That's the apparent motion of the star every year due to the Earth's orbit around the sun. That would be called the parallax. And like I said, in reality, it's a much smaller effect. It's not something you would see with the naked eye. You would actually have to take um, pictures of the night sky every night, probably over a period of years, 
and compare those very rapidly in order to detect it. And they probably use computers to do that now. I know they use computers actually to do that now, but in the early days of astronomy, somebody had to like flip through all those pictures and somehow try to detect just with their eye, uh, the very tiny parallax of a nearby star. Uh, anyway, to connect this to what you just did with your thumb, hopefully, think of the opposite sides of the orbit as being like the two eyeballs. So in January, uh, down here, that's like looking with your right eyeball. And then six months later, in July, you're using your left eyeball instead, and you've closed your right eyeball. And then the star that you're looking at would be like your thumb. The thumb exhibited parallax when you switched eyes. Here, it's the star that's exhibiting parallax. And instead of that um, sconce in the background on the wall, uh, the background would be the very far away stars. Oh, I see. So the parallax angle is actually 14 degrees. It still looks greater than that. But if we make the distance to the star much farther away, yeah, you can see that the parallax effect is much less. See, it's just barely, the, the red dot there is barely jiggling back and forth. If we put the star really close, we're going to see lots of parallax. Okay, now that you understand what parallax is, back to the lab. Here is the lab setup. Now you may recall that for my lens, I measured a focal length of something like nine inches. I know in the spreadsheet, I said centimeters, but I was really measuring in inches. I think this is a little bit uh, greater than nine inches, but let's just pretend that the focal point, let me get my laser pointer. I never seem to remember to do that. Uh, Here's the lens. Let's pretend that the focal point is nine inches away somewhere like right here, which would put the object, this is the object inside the focal point. And hopefully you remember that when an object is inside the focal point of a converging lens, you get a virtual image on the same side. If the object were outside the focal point, then you would have a real image on the opposite side of the lens. Okay, so I'm using bamboo skewers here. I think that's what these are called, or hot dog skewers. Uh, you can pick these up real cheap or just something else you've got at home that works. But you do need something that you can mount vertically that's thin. So you'll need two. And this one I've just fixed to a napkin holder with a bread tie. But here's the idea. You'll be looking through the lens from over here, but you won't be seeing the object itself, you'll be seeing the virtual image of the object. So we know that because this object is inside the focal point, uh, it will produce, or the lens will produce a virtual image of this object somewhere over here. Now, if it's right here, if this is where those rays appear to be diverging from, because remember, a virtual image is just that, it's not a real image. If you were to put, uh, let me back up, suppose the virtual image were right here. If you were to place a piece of paper there, it doesn't matter how bright the image is, you're still not going to see it there because there are no rays actually converging there. The rays just appear to be diverging from there when you look through the lens from over here. So you can't take a picture of it and you can't see it on a viewing screen because it's not there. It's a virtual image. But uh, because there is a virtual image there, it will exhibit parallax. That's what's kind of cool. It, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at something that's actually there or just the location of an image, a virtual image, it will still exhibit parallax. And so will, will this reference, I'm gonna call this the reference object. So this is the object for which we're forming an image. This is the reference object. And you'll notice that I've chopped this off so that when you look through the lens, you're just going to see the, the image of this guy. You won't see you know, the remainder of it sticking up above the lens but you'll see the actual reference object. Okay, so here's the top view. I've got the first bamboo skewer between these bricks. This is gonna be my object. And I'm imagining that it's just inside the focal point. So it's producing a virtual image somewhere out here. And then I've got my reference object mounted to the napkin holder. And the idea is if you can get the reference object and the virtual image to exhibit the same parallax, then you know that they're at the same place. Once they exhibit the same parallax, they're in the same place. And then all you have to do is measure the distance from the lens to the reference object. And that will be the distance from the lens 
to the virtual image. Of course, don't forget that the image distance for a virtual image is negative when you're talking about a converging lens. So if you, if you drop that minus sign, your calculations will come out wrong. All right, so you have to imagine that you're looking through the lens. And when you do this, you don't actually need to switch eyeballs. It would be better to just move your head from side to side. So you have a greater range of motion. So look through the right side of the lens. Here's your line of sight. If this diagram represents the actual situation, then clearly when you look through the lens, you will be able to tell that the virtual image of this bamboo skewer is in a different place from the reference object. Uh, obviously, if, if they looked like they were in the same place, then your line of sight would intercept both of them. And that's not the case in this diagram. Um, so right now, it would look to you as if the virtual image was to the left of the reference object. And then when you move your head to the other side of the lens, kind of like switching eyeballs with your thumb, that sounds odd out of context, switching eyeballs with your thumb. You know what I mean. When you move your head to the other side of the lens, the virtual image will jump to the other side. So now it's on the right side of the reference object. That parallax makes it skip to the other side. Now you'll also see parallax from the reference object. Even the reference object will appear to scoot just a little bit, but the virtual image will scoot more and it'll skip right over uh, the reference object. Kind of like this, this is what you could expect to see. So this is the, the rear bamboo skewer, the one in the back um, that's mounted to my napkin holder. This is the one that's serving as the object for my lens. So what I'm really looking at here is not the first skewer itself, but the virtual image of the skewer. And then far on the back, uh, above the lens, I'm seeing the actual reference object. This is not the, uh, the image. This is not a virtual image of the, the bamboo skewer in the back because we're not looking at it through the lens. We're just looking directly at it. Okay. And then when you move your head to the other side, because right now this is when you're looking through the right side of the lens, you move your head to the left side of the lens, they both exhibit parallax. Did you see that? Let me go back. Even the, uh, the actual skewer in the back shows parallax, but they exhibit different parallax. The virtual image has more parallax that causes it to skip right over uh, the, the image, or the, I shouldn't say the image, but the actual bamboo skewer in the back. So you want them to have the same parallax. So that means you will have to either adjust the location of the object, that's the bamboo skewer that you mounted in the bricks, or move the napkin holder back and forth. I say napkin holder, but of course it's whatever you've used to, to mount that rear bamboo skewer. And here's the way it actually looked for me. When you look through the lens, you're seeing two things. This front one is the virtual image of the skewer that I mounted uh, between the bricks to be my object. And then the lens is also forming an image of the rear skewer. Remember the rear skewer is the one that's uh, taller so we can see it above the lens. I think that this is, no, I know, this is a real image of the rear skewer. So just ignore this. We're interested in the virtual image of the nearby skewer and then the actual reference skewer. And when I moved the, the camera here, because I used the, the cell phone camera, to the other side of the lens, then they both exhibit parallax. See how this thing scooted to the other side? And so did the virtual image, but they have different parallaxes. So they're, they're obviously not in the same place. The virtual image of the near skewer is not in the same location as the actual reference skewer. So what have I done in this diagram? I can't remember if I moved the object or moved the reference object. I think I moved the reference skewer. I moved it up closer. And now you can see that when you look through the lens, that ray almost passes through the center of each. It does pass through each, just not the, the center of each. So they're, they're almost going to look like they're in the same place. When you move your head to the other side, they still look like they're in the same direction. Um, now, they're not actually in the same place, right? You can just tell from this diagram. The virtual image is here, the reference object is here, but they're, they're much closer than they were before. So ideally, you want the virtual image to be right on top of the reference object. You want them to be 
in the same place. And that might be a little confusing, like how can two skewers occupy the same place? Doesn't that violate the Pauli exclusion principle from chemistry? Well, you don't have two skewers in the same, the same place. What you have is two skewers where one is here and the rays coming out of this skewer are bent by the lens in such a way that they look like they're coming from the same location that the reference object actually is. Okay, so if you get that right, it's going to look more like this. You'll look through one side of the lens. Here I'm looking to the right side of the lens and they're almost perfectly lined up. You can see this one's shifted a little to the left. And this is important. When you move your head to the other side, they still have to be lined up. In fact, they should stay lined up the whole time. So move your head side to side in front of the lens and make sure that they're collinear the whole time. This is what it looks like for me with my kitchen setup. Again, ignore the, the real image of the back skewer formed by the lens. We're interested in this virtual image of the, the nearby skewer and the actual reference object. So they're clearly exhibiting the same parallax. And as I moved the camera around, I saw that they were lined up the whole time. And when you've done that, you can be confident that the location of this virtual image, in other words, the location of the point from which the rays appear to be diverging is the same as the location of the actual reference skewer so that you can now measure with your tape measure, you can measure the distance from the lens to the reference object. And that really is the image distance. Of course, stick a minus sign in front. So try to be as careful as you can and make it so that the center of the bamboo skewer lines up with the center of the other skewer. If you have even thinner objects, great. You probably would need something made out of metal to be rigid enough if it was really thin. I suppose if you made markings on a, on a piece of paper, that would work. If you had um, a fine point pen and you made some kind of vertical line, take a couple pictures and show me your setup. So yeah, I, this is in the, the written instructions, but uh, among your submissions, I would like to see something just like this. You're going to do this twice because you've already measured the focal length of your lens previously in part one uh, by dealing with real images. So you already know the focal length and you'll use that to predict where the image distance or what the image distance ought to be. And you may recall that when you put your object close to the focal point, whether it's inside or outside, your image ends up really far away, either at positive infinity or negative infinity. So just be aware that if you put your object too close to the focal point, in my case, nine inches from the lens, your image is gonna be so far away, it's going to be inconvenient. It'll be on the other side of the room. So you, you probably wanna leave a couple inches or so between where you know the focal point to be and the, uh, the object that you've mounted. In this case, my mirror skewer. Okay, so include something like this in your submission for just one of the trials. You'll be doing this just twice. You can just show me the pictures for one of them. What else do we have here? Okay, the last thing I'd like you to do is get some experience using a converging lens as a so-called magnifying glass. And there's actually two ways to do that. And that's not the only thing a converging lens is good for. Um, you know, you can also just use it uh, for reading, reading glasses. I think, I think that's how you correct presbyopia. It's been a few weeks already since we did opti optics. So I'm already forgetting whether you would use a converging or diverging lens to correct the condition that many people tend to have as they get older, where they can't focus um, near to them anymore. In any case, this is a different use. Uh, obviously, the, the point of a magnifying glass is to magnify, to make something appear bigger than it normally would. There's only so close that you can put something in front of your face before you can't focus on it anymore. Okay, so I don't have any diagrams here. I'm just going to describe this verbally. It will be up to you to draw two ray diagrams uh, demonstrating the two possible ways of using a converging lens as a simple magnifier. Now, in each case, you'll, uh, you'll produce a virtual image. But here's, here's the first way you can do it. Whatever you're trying to magnify, in this case, I've got this awesome recipe for al gratin potatoes from the Blue Bayou, which I had a few years back. They were so delicious. And then I made them and they weren't delicious. I, don't, I followed the recipe exactly, so that's a mystery. But 
the object that you'd like to magnify, put it fairly far from your face. So hold the magnifying glass uh, in front of your eye and the object that you're looking at, hold it rather far from your face and then slowly bring it towards the magnifying glass. And what's going to happen is eventually you'll get a virtual image at infinity. And that means that you, your eye can be in the relaxed state. Now, if you're nearsighted or farsighted, you wanna have your glasses on when you do this. Uh, yeah, I'd have to think about that to be 100% sure, but you should have your corrective lenses on when you do this. Because when your corrective lenses are on, then your eye works like uh, an ideal eye, which is to be relaxed when looking at something at infinity. So you'll be able to tell, I think, that your, your eye is in a relaxed state and suddenly you'll see a magnified virtu virtual image. Um, it'll be at infinity, which is why your eye can be relaxed. And that's how people usually use a magnifying glass. But there's a second way you can do, a uh, second way you can use it that gives you a little bit more magnification. It's barely noticeable. But this time what you would do is hold a magnifying glass in front of your eye as before, but put the object or the recipe here uh, right in front of the lens and then slowly back it up. So instead of starting from afar and bringing it, bringing it towards the lens, um, start right next to the lens and then move it back. And you should be trying to focus the whole time with your eye because eventually the, the virtual image will appear at your near point. And remember when something's at your near point, it does demand some accommodation. Your eyeball has to, you know, those little muscles around the, the lens have to squeeze it to shorten the focal length. So that takes a little bit of effort. And I, I find it difficult to even tell, like, am I focusing or am I not? But you'll probably be able to tell. And you get just a little bit more magnification that way. So when you put the virtual image at your near point, uh, slightly greater magnification, but takes a little bit of effort on your part. If you put the virtual image at infinity, your eye can be relaxed and there's not that much loss in magnification. So you can uh, delegate these responsibilities among your lab partners, but I need one diagram each for those two methods. When I say one diagram each, I don't mean one from each person. I mean, one for each method. Uh, those two methods for using a magnifying glass. And that shouldn't take you long. Half of this is, is presented in your book and you can figure out the rest. Okay, so to recap what's required for your submission, I need your spreadsheet. Oh, that's right, I have to show you that part. Let's do that right now. I've updated the spreadsheet. You've already done this part where you're using real images to determine the focal length of your lens. Then you can add a second sheet down here for the virtual images. I just need two different trials. S prime sub TH, that's theoretical. So you determine where you're going to put that nearby bamboo skewer, measure the distance between the object and the lens. And of course that needs to be greater than the, uh, no, not greater, less than. It needs to be less than the focal length in order to produce a virtual image. So you'll enter that here, that's your object distance. And then right here is where you will use the thin lens equation and the known focal length to calculate the theoretical image distance. And it's going to come out negative, right? It should, if it's a virtual image. So just solve the thin lens equation for S prime. And when you need to refer to the focal length, I think you should do it this way. You could just type in the number, but when you're doing your formula, you can click on another sheet, highlight the cell that you want, and then hit enter. See how it says real exclamation point? It's, uh, it's a syntax referring to another sheet. Hit enter, and then it'll update over here. Okay, so that's a cool feature that Excel has. You can reference cells in other sheets. Here is where you enter the measurement that you determine using the parallax method with a minus sign. And I don't need a percent error. They should be somewhat similar. If they come out real different, then I'll assume that you were lazy and didn't try to figure out uh, why they didn't agree. This does take some care. The thinner the objects you can use and the more careful you are to ensure that the parallax is equal, the better your results will come out. And that's it. So the Excel spreadsheet with two sheets, and I'll be checking the syntax. Uh, 
a few photos of your setup. So for the real images, I'd like to see a photograph of the real image produced on your viewing screen. For the virtual images, I'd like to see two side-by-side -side photos showing the parallax just for one of your trials. I need to see your two ray diagrams illustrating the two different ways of using a magnifying glass. And I believe that's it.